Joining us now for more on the situation in Ukraine is co-chair of the Ukrainian caucus in Congress, Republican Congressman Brian Fitzpatrick of Pennsylvania. Congressman, th thanks so much for taking the time with us tonight. My pleasure. So you recently visited the Ukrainian border as part of a bipartisan delegation. I was actually over there covering this when you were there. We are now one month into this war that many thought would be over in just a matter of days. Today, Russian military appeared to change posture, saying the goal is now to take Donbass, not all of Ukraine. In light of these developments, in your view, is Ukraine getting the upper hand on this conflict? Well, um, Vladimir Putin significantly underestimated the, the will of the Ukrainian people. It's something that I'm uh, firsthand witness to. I live there, actually. Uh, I, my last FBI assignment as an FBI agent uh, was in Ukraine um, right before I, I left the FBI to run for Congress. And um, anybody who's familiar with the people uh, know they have uh, hearts of gold. They have incredible uh, amount of passion. Uh, as far as what I saw on the border, uh, heartbreaking images, which I'm sure you saw, particularly on uh, the Ukrainian side uh, of Lviv province, where uh, these Ukrainian men, as you all know, age uh, 18 to 60, cannot leave the country. Just the, the images of them dropping off their elderly parents, their spouses, their children, uh, perhaps saying goodbye to them for the last time was just heartbreaking. And on the other side in Poland, where I was seeing the women and children come over, was equally as heartbreaking. It was really hard uh, to, to, to see the future for these people. They couldn't see the future. Um, you've called for a no-fly zone in Ukraine, which, of course, is what President Zelensky has continuously asked the world to enact for weeks now. If the Ukrainians are, I don't know about turning the tide, but maybe at least fighting off hard enough, is now the right time to risk a no-fly zone, given the implications, if the U.S. or NATO were to shoot down a Russian plane? Well, uh, there are hundreds of thousands of people in Mariupol uh, who are uh, stranded, uh, going on day 10 without food, water, or electricity. Uh, this could turn into what is already an awful situation into an epic disaster. Now, when I say that, um, what I'm talking about is essentially providing them with the defensive equipment that they've been asking for in the air to provide their own no-fly zone. Uh, these are things that could prevent, or I'm sorry, protect a, a humanitarian corridor uh, for these um, innocent civilians to make their way out. But Ukraine has not yet received them. So that would be the first step as far as supporting a Ukrainian no-fly zone, give the Ukrainian military the air equipment they need to enforce, create and enforce their no-fly zone. You, along with many of your colleagues and people all across the world, have called President Putin a murderous war criminal. I assume you think it's difficult to deal rationally with someone like that. I think that's the problem with this whole a situation. So then what's the end game? What, what, what do we do if Putin is as you describe it? Yeah. So I sit on the House uh, uh, Intelligence Committee. We've been getting evidence for quite some time now <clears throat> of Putin's deteriorating mental state. Um, so it is what it is, really. I mean, we what we need to do is do what's right. Um, I don't think that we should be allowing Vladimir Putin to determine what's provocative and what isn't. Um, which is essentially what uh, the posture of many people has been. I think that's a, a big, big mistake. I think we need to have our own red lines and enforce those red lines. Um, you know, as far as what, how to best handle Putin, Putin understands one thing, and that's strength. And Putin can smell uh, weakness like a shark can smell a drop of blood in the ocean. The president says NATO is more united than ever, and the U.S. has helped mobilize an unprecedented effort to sanction Russia, as you know. On the diplomatic front, do you believe President Biden has handled this crisis well? What more do you think he could have done? Well, I think some things have, have worked well and others haven't. So uh, the first thing that the administration deserves credit for is declassifying a lot of the intelligence to get out in front of the messaging uh, ahead of Putin's propaganda so that the whole world uh, was able to call his bluff when he had these false flags, uh, these pretexts that he had set to try to get world support behind his bogus operation <clears throat> and his criminal invasion. What hasn't worked well, the sanctions uh, are too little. Uh, we shouldn't be sanctioning 80 percent of the banks. We should be sanctioning 100 percent of the banks because Putin controls 100 percent of the banks. We shouldn't be sanctioning half of Russia's economy. We should be sanctioning all of it, 50 percent of Putin's GDP is the energy sector. That has largely remained untouched. And then lastly, getting uh, Ukraine the defensive equipment that they've asked for. Uh, the Ukrainians, every single day is important, and every single action that we take or don't take 
is significant. Congressman, quickly before we go, something that I, I was unprepared for when I, when I went over there and spent three weeks with Ukrainian refugees is the resolve. Uh, a lot of these women who crossed the border with their kids wanted to get them safe and then go back to help their husbands and brothers and fathers fight. You live there as an FBI agent. You know the people. Just speak briefly on the heart of the Ukrainian people. Uh, the one silver lining in all of this is that the world is now getting to witness what I got to experience uh, during my time there, the, the incredible courage of these people. Uh, and that's being exhibited by Volodymyr Zelensky, uh, who has shown the world he's a modern-day Churchill. Uh, he is willing to stay and die for his country. And I think it's important to note, uh, the United States of America is only 245 years old. Uh, that's just a few generations. And yet, we are the world's oldest democracy. No democracy on this planet has survived more than a few generations. And it's, it, it could disappear very quickly. And if Ukraine should be teaching the world anything, it's how fragile democracy is. Ukrainian independence is only 30 years old. And if anybody was questioning whether uh, the, the Ukrainians are worthy of NATO membership, many people were criticizing their military, saying they weren't up, weren't up to par. Hopefully their opinion has changed after witnessing what we're seeing now. It is a remarkable thing to see their resolve. Congressman Brian Fitzpatrick, thank you so much for taking the time with us tonight. Really do appreciate it. Thank you. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.